Hello! You know, this channel hasn't been very self-indulgent recently. Well, time to change all that with a look at ten action figures that I really, really like. Many of them are from the 80s, some are from the 90s, some are more recent. But I'll tell you one thing for sure, absolutely none of them come from the future. Right, I'm going to begin with one of my favouritest of all time. From 1983 in the Action Force line, it is Red Laser. In his terrifying buttoned-up military uniform and his mask that stops you seeing that I don't know, he's got a weird nose or something. Nobody knows, we've never seen him without it. He carries on his head the logo of the Red Shadows, the evil organisation run by Baron Ironblood. And you know that if somebody's called Baron Ironblood, they're probably not a very nice man. Accessory-wise, he comes with this quite amazing laser pistol stroke hairdryer type thing that fits into an exact replica of itself on his back, but in reverse, so that he can carry it around and put in his hands and shoot at people, presumably. He came with a vehicle called the Laser Exterminator, which I unfortunately don't have, but uh, he was sitting it like this and then presumably shoot lasers because it was a massive laser cannon that was like on a trailer. And I imagine a huge proportion of you by now, uh, mostly the Americans amongst you, will have realised that he is a repaint of a G.I. Joe action figure, namely one of the most uh, obvious ones, Cobra Commander. The story goes, uh, in England here we had a line called Action Force, which was based off Action Man. Action Man being a repaint of the original G.I. Joes. Wait, it gets more confusing. Action Man were much smaller um, figures which came with vehicles and stuff and little accessories, and frankly were a bit weird, because there was a whole range of them, and they all had the same face, as if it was just like some weirdo dressing up in an awful lot of military uniforms and shooting at himself. Um, and later on they sort of stretched it out a bit from actually real sort of uh, uniforms from the past into this... Uh, fictional war of the future where people are fighting the red shadows. Here is a red shadow to give you some idea of what they were like. Limited articulation, um, just the standard Star Wars four points, and, and most there's a lot of repainting going on. A lot of repainting. The whole body was like a German soldier figure and they put this weird helmet on. Anyway, I went to the shops one day with some money and bought the laser exterminator thing and was absolutely blown away by the fact that the figure that came with it was like a billion -ty million times better than the Red Shadows from an articulation point of view. Look at it. He's got the O-ring design where it's got a rubber band in it so it all moves around. And now compare that with... Uh, here, here we are. Oh. And once his gun's gone, all it looks like he's doing is drinking a cup of tea or something or he's got a really bad headache. Oh man. This helmet's murder. So, the whole shebang basically went that Palatoy, the makers of these, were moving over to using the G.I. Joe figures as Action Force. And indeed, they were released over here, just exactly the same as the American ones, with an Action Force name. But before that happened, they repainted a load and gave them away as vehicle drivers. Well, I say gave them away. I imagine it was taken into account in the price, but you know what I mean. So they came out of left field for us and were bloody amazing. And I do prefer the design of this to the uh, Cobra Commander there. I think uh, the weird thing he's got going on where he's pulled his, like, yoga pants over his shoes. Always ruined this figure for me slightly, although I do like the silver mask. So there we go, there be Red Laser. That was 1983's finest, and now we move through time, backwards, to 1977. And what actually may be my favouritest figure ever. I'll just warn you now, by the way, these aren't technically all figures. A couple of them might be statues. Cool, but you're furious now, aren't you? Unsubscribe! That's exactly how people do it. You have to do it like that or it doesn't take on YouTube. Right, Baron Kaza from the Micronauts. You may have noticed a subtle hint of Darth Vader going on here, to say the least. Um, this is a hell of a figure, and his backpack has fallen off already, which is handy, because I can put that to one side and then use it in a second. As you can see, everything is connected via magnets and balls. Well, I say everything, actually, just the main connectors. These other ones are just uh, metal balls there. Urgh, evil. And that gives you quite a nice range of articulation. It's also incredibly solid. I absolutely loved this toy. My dad bought it home for me one day. I can't remember why. Maybe it was my birthday. Maybe I just killed my first... Elephant. Maybe I just killed my first elephant. I've got no idea. It was a long time ago. But my god, this was the coolest thing ever. I mean, you can do this. What more do you want out of life, for God's sake? There was a grey version of this release called Count Magno, I believe, under the Interchangeables line. There's a little bit of pointless trivia for you. Here's something far more interesting. Everything fires off, even his belly button rocket. I'm never going to find that again. Uh, and also, these giant rockets here. Stick him in place of his limbs. 
I know you want one of these now, don't you? I bet you do. I hope I haven't shown you this before. I probably have, but I don't care, because it's cool. And here's another thing. Best toy ever, or what? If I remember, actually, you can even stick that... Whoa! You can throw it across the room accidentally, but you can even stick it in his belly button. Yeah, there we are. And now he's got a drill chest, which is something I've just invented. Anyway, Migos Micronauts were bloody fantastic. Uh, they re-released a load in 2002 by a company whose name I've forgotten. It began Palisades? I think it was Palisades. Don't quote me on that in case I'm wrong. But uh, they didn't sell that well, I believe, because I think the manufacturers messed them up at first or something. Oh, I don't know. And then by the time they'd fixed it, it was all a bit too late. But as a result, you can find later produced versions of these which look exactly the same. So that's all cool if you just want to stick him on your shelf. Next up, we go nowhere near as far back in time to 2009 and Masters of the Universe Classics version of Scareglow. How fucking cool is this? Um, Scareglow was a character from the 80s range, one of the last ones released um, in 1987, which means flipping rare. So, in the Masters of the Universe Classic line, where they went back and made the old He-Man figures in sort of slightly modern, posher designs, they released a good old Scareglow here. And my flipping heck, what a doozy. A friend bought me this, and it's like one of the nicest presents ever. I mean, look at it. It even glows in the dark. It comes with a scythe for the killings, and some sort of weird um, thing that sits in his hand with a castle grey skull on top of it. I don't know the significance of this. Um, it's described as like a skeleton key, I think, and it opens up, although there's nothing inside it. I think there's nothing missing in mine or something. Anyway. The main point is, he's got a furry loincloth, but apparently no flesh. Now, you may notice he's got a resemblance to Skeletor going on, although that's uh, coincidental, I believe. But when it was originally released, it was described as um, the evil ghost of Skeletor, which makes it sound like Skeletor died, and this is his ghost. But they actually meant he was an evil ghost who worked for Skeletor. There was a lot of stuff like that with the grammar on the old line. And, oh my god, this has been sitting on a shelf for years and it will probably never be replaced. Look at it. I want to show you it glowing in the dark, but uh, that never shows up properly on camera. Anyway, now we're all impressed by his nice strong teeth, it's time to, uh, hmm, this one actually comes from the same year, I didn't realise that. 2009, Doctor Who and the Vashta Narada. Well, technically not the Vashta Narada, because that was like a shadow that ate people's flesh all off in seconds, or even less than a second or something. This is actually the Vashta Narada, the Vashta Narada. Cool. Try saying that ten times fast. Or alternately, don't. You've probably got better things to do with your life. That, um, like, ate somebody's flesh and then controlled the suit afterwards. It's from an episode called uh, Silence in the Library, I believe. Which wasn't a marvellous episode. I didn't think so, anyway. But, my God, the figure is nice. It's nicely articulated, as all these uh, older Doctor Who ones were. The new ones are all a bit uh, tiny and look a bit shit, frankly. It's got on the back what looks like a cooling fan protector from PC case, so it gets bonus points for that. But mostly I love it because the skull is so nicely rendered, going back to old Scareglow there, but also it's got a real look of like a 50s um, sci-fi magazine cover, hasn't it? Skull-faced astronaut. You get the idea. It'd have some fantastic name like Weird Tales, and the story it was in would be called something like Minions of the Mars Monster, and when you read it, it actually wouldn't have anything like that in it, because that's what the covers to old sci-fi magazines were like. Also, it can do this. What more could you ask for? Now we jump back to 1982 and General Mumba from the Mego Eagle Force line, which is a really weird line. You'll notice it's much smaller than nearly other all figures of the time, or indeed most figures in general. Um, later on, sort of mask figures and that used about the same scale, but it was a bit of a rarity back then, but most oddly, made of metal, except for the head. The whole line was. I like General Mumba because he doesn't look like a particularly sort of buff type. He just looks like some guys let himself go a bit, and it doesn't matter because he's the controller of an evil nation or something. They did come with guns originally. I've never seen one of the guns, which is a shame, because uh, I'd like to know how they fit in the hand. Very badly, I would assume, actually, from looking at them. Uh, it's an interesting line, uh, Eagle Force. It um, was released 1982, as I said, and the company went bust very shortly afterwards. And apparently it was selling really well, but then they went bust, and so it went off the... Uh, 
shops and that was the end of that and a load of their other IP was bought up by other companies but not this so it languishes in the past I think there was some Kickstarter thing or something similar recently to uh, bring it back in sort of different figure fashion I don't know the details google it if you're interested but we've got five points of articulation here on our metal general number and we're quite happy with that thank you very much Cheap uniform, but expensive sunglasses. I like his style. And now, oh my god, I'm going to have to make way for this one because it's a bit larger. Oh god, and I've dropped it. Oh, it's all right. It's only bloody Birdman. Yes, this is like a promotional figure made for the movie Birdman, which you are probably aware of as being like an Oscar winner recently. I really loved the film and I really wanted one of these figures. And basically, the people who made one said I could have one as long as I put a description in the link. So I've done that. Thanks, lads. And now I have to explain it for anybody who hasn't seen the film. Uh, basically, it's about Michael Keaton playing an actor who in the 80s played a character called Birdman, who was a superhero. You've probably got that idea. And he's now off doing a slightly poncy play and trying to make himself sort of artistically relevant. But it ain't going too well for him. And old Birdman here sort of haunts him as a kind of subconscious presence, mostly having a go at him and telling him to do different things. Look, I don't want to give it away because it will spoil the film somewhat. But my God, I love that film. It's one of those things. Um, I very nearly go didn't go and see it because it sounded very, very arty, and I have, I must admit, a very low tolerance for pretentiousness. But it worked very nicely. It was bloody funny, and it's bloody weird, and of course has perfect casting, because Michael Keaton was Batman in the 80s, so there is a very nice analogue going on. Do you want to hear the figure talk? People, they love blood, they love action, not this talky, depressing, philosophical bullshit. Well, it's too late now. I've built the channel on that idea. It's got a really high-quality speakery thing in it anyway. I don't know why I'm trying to sell it. You can't buy one if you want one. Ha! I've got it. The only thing I don't like is the skin on the face has a kind of Marvel Zombies look to it. Do you see what I mean? But look at it from a distance and you don't give a monkeys. One thing I was slightly upset about. Box damaged in transit. Oh, I wasn't packed very well. It looks like he's trying to peck his way out. It's a pity because it's a good box. Warning! Contains giant ego. Not suitable for adults with realistic life goals. Ooh, perfect for me then. Do you want to hear something else? Shave off that pathetic goatee. Get some surgery. 60's the new 30, motherfucker. Okay, that hit a little bit too close to home. We're going to move on to the next one now. Optimus Prime from 1990 and the Transformers Action Masters line. Autobots, roll yourselves into a location that is not this one. Of course, his famous catchphrase. Um, I hated these at the time, actually. I remember seeing them in the shops and thinking, bloody hell, they're getting a bit desperate. Because I talked like that back then, for some reason. Um, to cut a long story short, they don't transform. I thought, what is the point of a transformer that does not transform? But as years have gone on, I've still got an appreciation for the design of them. It's got that animated look, although slightly slimmed down. And they just look quite nifty and very... Um, representative of the character, I think is a good way of saying it. The English articulation is weird. The arms only move at the top, the head moves there, but it's got like a weird O-ring type of design. It was made by Hasbro, you know, the same people who uh, produced the old uh, G.I. Joe figures here, and they went for a sort of semi-O-ring system that doesn't quite work. Because uh, you've got to sort of move it up and then the legs bend like that, but they're not quite like that. It's all very odd, and the majority of them, if you find them secondhand, do have snapped elastic bands as a result. But it's a little cool Transformer character, and I'll tell you what, I need more of those in my life. You go and sit over there and have a nice time. Actually, yeah, sit. You can have a cup of tea later. If you're good, no screaming at Megatron. And now, flash forward to 2007. And Kia Kanos from the Crimson Empire comics and Star Wars, obviously. I'm going to be pronouncing it Kia Kanos, I've never heard it said out loud, and probably never will. The whole point of him was, he is an Emperor's guard, who is fanatically loyal to the Emperor, but the Emperor's snuffed now, isn't he? Because we've all seen Return of the Jedi, but... Old Kier Kanos here, he doesn't want to give up on the whole thing and wishes to avenge the Emperor to an extent by going after somebody who betrayed him. One of the Emperor's Royal Guard who betrayed him. And you see that the Royal Guard are kind of fanatically good fighters and also kind of fanatic in the head, which is less good. I liked it because um, you only ever see these guys in the film just sort of standing around with a crappy stick 
and their robes on. They never do anything, and it was nice to see them actually being effective at something. Because, you know, you wouldn't have all these weird bodyguards just for show, would you? Surely they'd be able to fight? Well, apparently they have this cool armour under their robes, etc, etc, etc. The comic is a really good one, one of the better Star Wars comics, in my opinion. Although there was then a sequel coming to it later, which was a bit shite, from what I recall. So, Yabu sucks to that. There is, however... <coughs> a massive problem with this figure, which uh, kind of uh, spoils it for me. When you remove his mask, he doesn't look anything like the character from the comics, hence why the mask is kept on. Wait for it! Is this not quite obviously Piers Morgan with a big scar down his face? Has he even got hair exactly the same as him? It absolutely freaked me out the first time I sort of removed the helmet and discovered Piers Morgan was apparently one of the Emperor's elite guard. But there we are, you've got to do something when you're not on television, I suppose. Right, back in time again, 1984, and The Joker from the Kenner Superpowers Collection. A really nice rendition of a classic version of the character. He's got his purple jacket on, with its long coattails, which sadly do seem obviously stuck on, but we'll have to give him away with that. Unpleasant shrieking face, which is as it should be, with weird semi-horned hair, and an action feature that, wait for it, doesn't completely cock up the way the figure looks. Action features are usually a bit crap, because, you know, there's a massive pig in the back, but the Superpowers Collection was much more subtle about it. Squeeze his legs, Bang! He hits things with his Joker hammer, Hujima Wudgie. And that wouldn't normally be quite enough to make me love a figure, but it's actually the hammer that does it. You see, it has this J on it, but turn it round. Look, it's got a terrifying Joker-like face on it. You guessed it! He can wear it as a freaky hat. Instant love. How can you not like that? I mean, seriously, absolutely fantastic. And uh, I was amazed to see this. I didn't really see this at the time. I only saw it years later. And um, I was used to, around 1989, these similar figures released for the old Batman film. And I'll tell you what, the Joker from that was nowhere near as good. Uh, the plastic sort of doesn't hold as much detail, the sculpt isn't as good, the head is rubbish, a hat keeps falling off, it's a crap figure. So to see this much earlier and much better version blew me away a bit. And they did actually reuse this body for a Jack Nicholson version Joker later. Here it is. It has some crap thing where, um, I don't know, temperatured water changes the skin on the face and all that stuff nobody really cares about. You're not Zartan, stop pretending. But uh, the head is a really good likeness of uh, Nicholson from the film, as opposed to the original Joker figure from the line, which, as I said before, was shite. Anyway, nice to see a quality body reused, although the colour scheme is a bit crazy. And now we get on to our tenth and final one, although technically I've already shown you eleven, really, haven't I, because the two extra ones at the start. Let's ignore that and go to 1981, and the Empire Strikes Back Wampa Beast. Wampa? Wampa? No idea. Let's go for Wampa, because it sounds funnier. Bloody loved this figure at the time, and I still do. It's got no feet. It's got, like, trunks for its tiny, freakish legs. It's got triangles where its eyes and mouth should be. Why? I don't know, but I love the aesthetic. But more importantly, it was really fun to play with. Spring-loaded, rip-your-face-off action. And, of course, it can also lift people above its head. Doesn't work very well with G.I. Joe, because of course the legs bend. Poop! Over there. Oh god, no, don't scratch it, that one's expensive. Whew. Dodged a bullet there, folks. This one's yellowed from age, as many of these things have, but you still get the most idea. It's like a weird, semi-cuddly, gormless-looking demon. I don't really know how else to describe it. I always love that spring action, rip Luke's face off, though. What more could you want? Probably quite harrowing for Mark Hamill, actually, because uh, I don't know if you know, the reason he gets attacked by the Wampa and his face scratched is because he had a car accident in real life and um, smashed his face up, bless him. So that's probably not something he wants to relive through the medium of a giant walking rug with ice cream cones sticking out of his head. Or maybe he does. I don't know. I've never met him. But if I do, I'll be sure to ask him. So there you go. That be 10 technically 12, but let's dial it back to 10 figures. Been looking for an excuse to do this for ages, and the Birdman figure tipped me over. <sighs> I want to do it again now. Obviously, this remains the greatest action figure ever made. I am not disputing that. We must never dispute that. Subscribe for more.